Uh, thank you very much indeed. So it's really the road from single incision surgery to uh, no hole surgery. And uh, HIFU goes back many years, in fact, to 1927, where a chap called Wood looked at the biological effects of high frequency sound waves and uh, aptly named uh, William Fry, the Fry brothers, uh, started uh, producing lesions in the brain of cats and monkeys. In those days, they had to do it by opening the skull, whereas, uh, in fact, nowadays, there are ways of getting into the skull with a uh, haifu beam without opening the skull. Um, but this was the uh, size of the machines that they were using, and... Uh, they were doing this just when Parkinson, the drugs for Parkinson's were coming along, so that uh, died a death. But it started being used for, suggested for cancer treatment. And in 1997, uh, the first patient was treated with extracorporeal haifu uh, in China. If you look at this high impact journal, you'll find that uh, the use of sound waves for destroying things isn't new. And... Uh, as you know, that diagnostic ultrasound, we're interested in the scatter and the image that comes back rather than what happens at the focal point. But even with diagnostic ultrasound, there is a very, very small rise in temperature at the focal point due to absorption. And uh, haifu can really be thought of like light, like we all did when we were younger, uh, putting a lens either on the back of our hands or on a spider and uh, creating a focal point and then uh, burning, causing a burn or starting a fire. And uh, light obviously does it through air, but haifu goes through fluid. And if you take the power up from the diagnostic ultrasound of 0.02 of a watt uh, through the therapeutic uh, effect as... Uh, physios use to 200 watts. In other words, 10,000 times the imaging en energy, you can cause a burn at the focal point. And uh, unlike hypothermia, uh, if haifu comes up to about 80 degrees centigrade virtually instantaneously and will cause cell death, Every time you fire this beam, you get a little lesion the size of a grain of rice. And uh, it works through two mechanisms. Firstly, it's the heat, but the second one is cavitation. And cavitation is basically you get the compression and rarefaction which draws gas out of solution, forming bubbles which uh, change in size. And it's a little bit like if you take the... Uh, top off a champagne bottle, the gas comes out of, uh, the bubbles come out of solution and cause this uh, uh, cavitational effect. And you have stable and unstable cavitation as the ultrasound wave uh, changes. So the bubbles, either uh, uh, with higher pressure they're smaller or lower pressure they're larger. And if they just alternate like that, that's stable. But if the bubbles collapse, then uh, that's unstable cavitation, and you get a huge energy change in the microenvironment. And if that bubble collapses like this firework, if it's in open space, then the energy spreads outwards in all directions. Uh, but uh, if it's against a hard surface, and this is a, a propeller underwater, and this damage is not uh, caused by rust, this is cavitational damage, because if the bubble collapses next to a hard surface, you get a, a pressure just like the, uh, a bullet um, causing that sort of damage. And this is what happens within the cells itself. You can use Haifu for various things and we had a uh, operational officer at the John Radcliffe Hospital some years ago and I asked him if he'd ever heard of cavitation. He said yes, I used to work uh, uh, in the Ministry of Defence and it was how we used to track the Soviet submarines because the propellers gave off a certain cavitational profile and you could tell whether they had three or four propellers and what type of submarine they were. 
Uh, interestingly, HIFU can also be used to punch holes in cells to let genes in. And another use uh, that we're looking at as well is that you can put little, uh, uh, you can put drugs into liposomes, inject them into the body, put a HIFU beam over, for example, the liver, break the liposomes over and open so you get targeted drug delivery. But in that microenvironment, you can get uh, uh, just energy deposited, which has temperatures high as the surface of the sun or pressures that are deeper than the ocean. They had this exhibition in London a couple of years ago looking at the power of sound. Uh, in China, they've treated about 30,000 patients, mainly people with osteosarcomas and liver tumors, very few uh, renal tumors but it's been used for these other things. And the brain tumors, as I said, as a group in Toronto, who have now been able, using time reversal technology, to put a HIFU beam into the skull through the bone, and it's totally altered and unusable. But if you then bounce it off and outside the skull, you can look at the alteration of the wave. And by using phased array transducers around the head, you can put an altered beam into the skull so that once it's in the skull, you can actually start ablating uh, renal tumors. And there's a group, as I say, in Toronto and Zurich that have been looking at that. So uh, this is the uh, research establishment in Chongqing in uh, China that we have links with, our new cancer center in the Churchill. This was a machine that we had from China. And this is the one that we've got now. This one, although it looks like a CT scanner, actually the important bit is just this area here. And this has just got a big chain in it, which actually allows this to move in different directions. So that's the important part of it, just uh, there. And this is, if you look down on the top of, uh, top of that downwards, this is what you see. And we have a diagnostic transducer so we can actually see what we're doing. And this is the treatment transducer. There is another system, an Israeli system, Incitec, which is MRI guided, but this is ultrasound guided, so you can virtually see what's happening in real time. And basically, as I say, this is demonstration of a liver. You just get these little grains of rice. That's the uh, middle of a block of ox's liver. Very sharp demarcation between live and dead tissue, about six cells thick. Uh, that's the middle of a block of ox's liver showing how precise you can be with it. And every time you fire it, you get one of these little lesions. And basically, just by arraying the lesions side by side, you just build up a 2D and 3D ablation of it, uh, such as demonstrated there with a uh, liver tumor. <coughs> and this is a, a phantom that uh, China gave us so that you can see this little white area there is what you get every time you fire the machine uh, and that's quite a nice thing because that just fades after a while and then you can do it again. So we looked some time ago at the uh, safety and toxicity and the performance of these for liver and kidneys. If we concentrate on the kidneys, I'll just say that it works a lot better for the uh, liver tumors that are suitable. We had about 90% ablation. But this is what we did uh, early on with the kidneys treating the suitable ones with HIFU and resecting them or just monitoring them with radiology. Um, some criticisms of that trial in as much as we didn't biopsy them first, so we were just going on the MRI. And uh, very little in the way of side effects, a little bit of discomfort. These are done under general anaesthetic, but they all went home the next day. They could have gone home the same day. The main problem that we see is a little, sometimes skin toxicity. You get a little bit of blistering on the skin, and we have had one uh, more serious burn on the skin due to technical problems. Uh, it will make a hole in bowel if, you, if bowel's in the way, so it's important that bowel is out of the way. Um, but very uh, other, a few other problems, and this is example of some of the blistering that you get because you can get these prefocal peaks as it goes through different tissue. Uh, this was uh, one with a small renal tumor with uptake there which disappears after uh, 12 days, six months, a year and in fact five years later this was one of the early ones there's still uh, no uptake there. But what we've done recently is a, a new study looking at tumors less than four centimeters, biopsying them first, then HIFU, and then doing a partial nephrectomy on them, and looking at histology. 
So there are quite a lot that aren't suitable for treatment due to position at the moment. Uh, we've treated 10. Here's um, one with the tumour there. And after treatment, that disappears. We then resected that. And all of that was necrotic. The only viable bit was a little rim of viable tumour down at the bottom. And this was another patient which um, not quite so much as viable tumour there, although a lot of this is ablated. Uh, multiple, uh, this is VHL, again with the central bit that we targeted virtually all destroyed. We didn't target the other uh, tissues there. So uh, we've treated 10 out of the 36 screened, as I say, so that's um, quite a lot not suitable for treatment. And that's mainly because we can't see them when we put them on. If, if A lot of this depends on being able to see them with that diagnostic probe, which is not nearly as good as the ones in radiology. So, in fact, as that's got better, our treatment's got bigger, uh, better as well. And uh, we have had uh, evidence, significant evidence of ablation in half of them. <clears throat> and here, uh, one of the problems is the ribs get in the way and the perinephric fat gets in the way. This, interestingly, was a tumour in a renal transplant that we treated with HIFU. And uh, I did end up doing a partial nephrectomy on him as well because post-biopsy uh, did show that there was a bit of active tumour, but in fact 90% of that had been destroyed. So we do have problems uh, with it in terms of uh, the ribs, the perinephric fat, and the time taken, which is uh, often a couple of hours under general anaesthetic for a four centimeter tumor. But the technology is going to get better. And uh, one thing that I think I would like to think about doing now is taking the VHL patients, which we mo I monitor up to about two and a half centimetres. We did actually write up one in the Journal of Urology some years ago who had metastatic disease from a 2.9 centimetre tumour. So I, like most other people, watch them till they get to two and a half centimetres and then uh, do a partial nephrectomy on them. I think we could try treating some of these with HIFU at two centimetres and if they didn't change in size then uh, just uh, leave them alone. And a uh, big team uh, who've been involved in this and uh, acknowledgements to them. Thanks.